to really understand uh, how in water works, we must first understand what intermolecular forces are. I call them IMFs, uh, so sometimes I abbreviate that. An intermolecular force is a force of attraction between two or more whole molecules. Uh, if you think an interstate highway connects more than one state, I've got a map right here that uh, shows us how, say, I-35 connects us all the way from Mexico all the way up to Canada. Um, well, an intermolecular force is something that connects those uh, two different molecules. So if you, in this comparison, the different states would be two different molecules, um, and the interstate highway will connect those two. Now, there are four different intermolecular forces that we'll study, and it's the ion-ion force, hydrogen bonding, dipole-dipole, and the London dispersion force, also known as the van der Waals force. The, um, now, the ion-ion is uh, sometimes technically not referred to as an intermolecular force since it uh, is technically an ionic bond. But um, it is, they're all ionic bonds and usually something like salt. Now, hydrogen bonding is a covalent bond where either hydrogen or either fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen are present. It can only be these three elements. So F, O, N are the ones you want to remember. These are the most electronegative elements, and uh, that's why. Uh, they are, that, and that's what makes them very polar bonds. So something like water, nitric acid, or hydrofluoric acid will have um, some hydrogen bonding. Dipole-dipole uh, interactions are between all polar bonds, and you, I have some examples here. And also the London dispersion force is the consolation prize of intermolecular forces because everything you know, gets one of those. It's definitely the participation ribbon. Uh, even noble gases get uh, get London dispersion forces. So every single molecule will have um, an LDF or London dispersion force. Um, technically, hydrogen bonding is a dipole-dipole force, but since it is the strongest of them, since it has the strongest electro uh, electronegative forces, then it is considered, uh, we give it, to, it its own class. So here's a couple of pictures of what they would look like. Uh, these are polar molecules. I can tell because there is a, uh, oxygen has a slightly negative charge. Uh, there are a, remember that there would be two lone pairs here on this uh, oxygen. And then this hydrogen is creating a partial charge, partial positive charge. So we have a negative and a positive polar bond right here. Well, the hydrogen will align itself to this other oxygen here, uh, and this positive will attract to this negative as well. Now, let me be clear. This part right here emphasizes the intermolecular force. This is a hydrogen molecule, and this is a hydrogen molecule. So it connects the two molecules. There is nothing in between this, though. There are no electrons. There's nothing actually uh, physically there but it's just an attraction between a positive and a negative, almost like two different magnets that would be attracted to each other. Here, uh, this hydrogen bond, uh, well, this would, wouldn't be hydrogen bonding. Uh, this would be just a dipole-dipole attraction between uh, chlorine and hydrogen. Uh, this is dipole-dipole because there is no fluorine or oxygen or uh, nitrogen. So a uh, water molecule, remember, has a bent shape with, a, uh, with an angle of 105 degrees, and it has those two lone pairs on the top, and that's really helpful to understand. And then another picture of some uh, water molecules that look like this. Now this one would represent uh, a hydrogen bond, or two different hydrogen bonds. So there's two different locations that each water molecule will attach to. And that's going to be really important. Water is so special and so unique. This is a great simulation to show you about intermolecular forces. So let's look at two nonpolar molecules. They will have London dispersion attraction or London dispersion forces. And you can see a small bit of attraction here. Now, if I try to pull them apart, 
it takes uh, not that much energy to pull them apart. And they don't really want to go back together. Uh, it takes, they have to be pretty close to attract to each other. So they're not all that attractive. Now, if I have two polar molecules, now they are now aligned up with a negative and a positive and a negative and a positive. And they are a dipole-dipole attraction. We have positive and negative poles, positive and negative poles. You see the dipole, that's why it's called dipole. So as I pull it, it is a much stronger attraction. And it takes a lot of energy to pull those away. And uh, that energy in chemistry would be in the form of heat. And that's why it takes uh, so, much temper uh, so, much so much heat to change the phase of a uh, substance. So now let's make a prediction of what a nonpolar and a polar attraction would be like. Would it be stronger, or stronger, less, or more of the same? So let's pull it apart. And it takes a little more energy than the non, than the two nonpolars, but a lot less energy than the two polars. Okay, so uh, that help hopefully lets me uh, gives you a better idea of what intermolecular forces look like. Let's explore this simulation with several different molecules. I have hydrogen, I have bromine, hydrogen. Uh, bromide and hydrogen and hydrogen bromide. So let's start with hydrogen here. Uh, what type of intermolecular forces would I have? Would I have, well, you should say London dispersion forces because that's the only one that's, uh, that's going to happen. There is no hydrogen bonding here. Uh, so if I pull them apart, it doesn't take all that much energy. Now let's look at bromine now. We have a slightly more electronegative element, but it still only has London dispersion forces and still doesn't take that much effort or much energy to pull it apart. I want you all to just see um, where, how far it takes from uh, the star to get pulled away. Okay. So now let's look at this one. We now have hydrogen bromide and hydrogen bromide. This is not hydrogen bonding, but this is a dipole-dipole interaction. We have a positive pole and a, po a negative pole. As we pull these apart, it gets pretty difficult to pull them apart. I'll have to bring it back, and let's try one more time. All right, much stronger, okay? So those uh, forces can make a difference in how well they will bond and how uh, how well how um, that will make a difference in their change in their state of matter as well. And now let's look at hydrogen and hydrogen bromide. So now we don't have as many bonding sites or many availabilities for uh, for a intermolecular force. So it's not going to be as strong as the last one. Okay. So because water is so polar and it can make two hydrogen bonds for every molecule, it can form uh, very uh, unique properties. Uh, one, it's a universal solvent because water is polar and it can easily dissolve many substances and is commonly known as the universal solvent. Uh, it can, things dissolve in water because of polarity. Water molecules are always in motion, and when they collide with the solute that is added to the attractive forces, break up the solute up. This is called dissolving, and technically it's called hydration. Hydration can be shown in this picture with a cation and an anion. The water molecules will orient themselves so that the negatives will face towards their opposite uh, respective ions. So the oxygen is facing towards the sodium and the hydrogens are facing towards the chlorine. Uh, when you multiply many, many water molecules and many, many sodium chloride atoms, uh, then you end up with a lot of uh, dissolved molecules and those dissolved molecules end up taking up the entire uh, container. And we'll see that more later in another, the next unit. The second property of water is its density. Uh, the solid is less dense than a liquid, so ice will float. 
That's because the hydrogen bonds stiffen as water freezes and pushes the molecules further apart. This will increase the volume. If I increase the volume, I will decrease the density. Now, ice will act as an insulator, and it keeps large bodies of water from freezing totally solid. A, a very uh, large lake will only freeze maybe a foot uh, deep when uh, the rest of the water is still liquid water. And that's how the fish can still survive from year to year. The third and fourth properties for uh, water are that water has high heat effusion and vaporization, and water has a very high boiling point. It has a high boiling point compared to other covalent bonds, and this is because of hydrogen bonding. So lots of energy is required to overcome the hydrogen bonds in order to make water molecules move past each other. So they need to, it requires a lot of energy to break those bonds to change phases from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. And the fifth property is that water has cohesive and adhesive forces as well as surface tension. Water sticks to itself, which is called cohesion, which causes high surface tension. Water can stick to other objects as well, which is called adhesion. Uh, and uh, this is actually exhibited in capillary action as well, or when, uh, when water can climb up the xylem in a plant cell. So we know now that we know that there are three different states of matter and you should be familiar with what they are called whenever they change from states of matter. These uh, changes of state is what we would call them. If we change from a solid to a liquid, we are melting or we are freezing. So the melting point and the freezing point are going to be the same. Now, if we're going from a liquid to a gas, we were either evaporating or we are condensing or condensation. Uh, these are going to have the same point as well. This is also called the boiling point. This, uh, so if I'm, just make sure you note the arrow. The arrow is important. Like going from a liquid to a gas is evaporation, but gas to a liquid is condensation. Now, you may not know about solids. Going from a solid to a gas is called sublimation, but going from a gas straight to a solid is called deposition. And this is one last simulation to show you about what water looks like. So here I can look at neon and argon, which are both noble gases. So, and I can look at them as a solid, as a liquid, or as a gas. And so now let's look at water. Now water, as you would expect, would look like this. All the molecules are bouncing around, flying around. Now, if I look at a liquid, I look like this. Now everybody note the volume of what it looks like, okay? Now, as a solid, whenever I make it a solid, it the volume gets actually a little bit bigger. And I will actually stop this right here. Notice this little gap right here. This is part of this little structure that it makes. It makes this um, actual physical structure, sometimes in the atmosphere, almost a crystalline structure of ice and it looks really cool and that's why hail actually looks really special because way up in the atmosphere it's so cold enough to make that structure um, or uh, when you can freeze ice at um, in your freezer and it looks a little bit different but we're looking at the space that's in between these so this is what affects the density and it's what affects um, a lot of different other things so notice that the water molecules are actually interacting more with a lot of hydrogen bonding and those molecules are sticking together. That's the key difference. So when I ask you, why is water special? You say hydrogen bonding. That's all I have for you guys. So remember, it's always a great day to be a Viking.